Our first guest on the program today is Ron Gregory. We've had Ron on the show a few times now. Ron, good morning, sir. How are you? Well, good morning. I was afraid of what title you might be giving me, so I was kind of <laughs> hanging back here. That was um, off the air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ron, Ron were, you ever in, were you ever a Boy Scout? No, I was not a Boy Scout. My sons have been Boy Scouts, but I was not. I, that's why I still can't tie knots, so I don't buy shoes with strings in them. <laughs> Get those Velcro ones, man. When you're, when you're... It would have been much, much better if I hadn't been a Boy Scout. Yeah. Hey, uh, give me your impressions of the governor's State of the State speech from last week, Ron. Well, I think it's typical of, uh, of this governor. Uh, nothing that was uh, uh, all that unusual. Uh, I don't think in an election year such as this, particularly with his last uh, hurrah, as well as the fact that uh, obviously he can't run for re-election, but he can run for the Senate. Uh, I think that basically nobody expected any uh, shots heard around the world. Uh, we didn't have that. Uh, I, he, ad he addressed some of the concerns that we've had, but they've been ongoing. Um, you know, one thing about this governor is he has a methodology by which he sort of uh, steps around better than most politicians. And he may not have been a politician all his life, but he can do a great job of avoiding uh, confronting things head on. And I think he, I think most things he did pretty well with that as well. Uh, I think this is still the one thing that uh, I and most political observers in the state are fascinated by is how well he does that and how receptive the public is to uh, his presentation. Uh, you know, he, uh, I, I always refer to him or occasionally refer to him as Mr. Haney from the old Green Acres <laughs> days. Yeah, Pat Buttram. Um, yep, the actor. And, and, and uh, you know, at one time, uh, one of the great, well, I always say the greatest line in any of the situation comedies from when I was little was when when uh, it's the boss uh, looked at Zeb the fire hand, the fire the uh, hand there on the farm and said uh, Zeb how dumb are you and he said I don't know Mr Haney I've never been tested in my full <laughs> capability uh, sometimes I'm wondering if uh, if the governor has been tested to his full capability. Oof. So, so not not a big fan is what you're saying there. <laughs> I'm not a big fan. I did, I have made the comment that um, Jim Justice uh, is uh, is uh, the, the, the Alex Mooney is the one man who can force me to vote for Jim Justice. Ooh. I like you're bringing it today, Ron. I like this. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you this question. So, the the state has. Uh, just enjoyed uh, five, six really good years economically, uh, revenue-wise. Uh, right. Everything seems to be looking up and, and improving. Uh, in the Eastern Panhandle, there is a reluctance to give the governor credit for that. The Eastern Panhandle mood seems to more so give that uh, credit to the legislature and, and even to an extent the federal government with all the money that it, it's, it throws at West Virginia, and, and especially during the pandemic. Uh, around the rest of the state, however, I am told the governor is very popular. His poll numbers seem yeah. to indicate that, uh, and that he does get credit around the state. He's very he's very well liked throughout much of the rest of the state. Uh, can you explain the two differences in terms of how people perceive the man and and how much credit they're willing to give him for the state's economic success during his time as governor? Well, I, I don't want to come on here this morning too strong and say that I think that the really great, super nice farm hand down the road friend of ours. The governor is not really who he appears to be, but, uh, as an example, and at any press briefing back when they actually had them live and in living color and you could actually see the governor, um, the toughest question could be asked of him and he would still smile his way through it. And he would, you know, cross my heart and, and on my mama's grave and 
all the other little comments that he makes, uh, he would use those. He would drop them during his uh, response to any any kind of question. It was tough. Uh, he doesn't do that as much as he once did, but I do think that out on the road, uh, there's a couple of things. One, uh, I'm uh, in many ways appalled at how not only he, but some of our other elected officials seem to be, uh, they travel the state and they hand out, or their district, and they're handing out checks as though they're their own checks. And, um, you know, if, if Wally Barron, for example, who I think was a much better governor than people give him credit for, we can, if we set aside the uh, one episode that he was involved in, Arch Moore, who I think is the best governor the state ever had regardless, um, they, um, you know, if, if any either one of those two fellows had gone out on the road, had gone to uh, Shepherd University, for example, I have no idea if Governor uh, Justice has done that or not, but if they went to Shepherd University and did a, they brought the whole student body in and gave a big plastic check for uh three million million dollars, I think they would have been in trouble. I think we would all question them. Uh, media would have been all over them. Now we can shut state government down if we want to for two or three days. I ask, and I'm, I may have mentioned this on the air before, but one of the things that was always mentioned when I was uh, younger was uh, if they closed the state government for a, a storm or for something like Rockefeller storm that didn't take place or something. There was always news articles done. There was always publicity about how much it cost the state to operate in a day, how much money was lost with no productivity. Now I even ask every, basically every official of the state who should have known how much does it cost the state of West Virginia when the governor closed, closes it up for a half a day or for a day, extra day on Christmas or New Year's or whatever holiday it may be. And there was nobody who had a ready answer uh, because nobody pays any attention. I'm going to say that part of the um, problem, I guess it's a problem, uh, maybe maybe the joyful feeling of everybody toward their governor is a great thing. And in a sense, I guess it is. But I think one of the problems is we don't, we that being media, uh, don't ask questions and know what's going on with those officials like we once did. We're in a space age. We're in an age when things move very quickly and very rapidly. We're interested in the whole world. We want to know what's going on this morning in uh, Afghanistan and what's going on this morning in Russia and what the Chinese are doing. And I'm not sure we pay quite enough attention to what our own elected officials do. This governor gets away off with awfully easy questions lobbed at him and awfully easy answers given back. And uh, I, I think that that's part of it. The public never hears, or if they hear it, they don't hear it drummed into them what it means uh, when there is some problem in, in government. Bill, uh, good morning, Ron. Uh, looking morning. at the Secretary of State's list of uh, candidates, uh, I'm seeing a lot of Republicans. I'm seeing very, very, very few Democrats that are choosing to run for office. Uh, we Every time we talk to a uh, Democrat official, they say, well, we're going to have a solid uh, plate of, uh, of good candidates this year. But I don't see it materializing. Are you seeing anything different than what I am? Oh, I absolutely think in what you do. I um, I think that uh, Steve Williams may well be the mayor of Huntington, may well be unopposed by any kind of name Democrat for the governor's office. And frankly, uh, as far as the other offices are concerned, uh, I hear, I keep hearing new and different and, and the possible speculation of some Republican, but running for one of the Board of Public Works or the executive positions we call them now uh, i keep hearing that but i i don't hear anything about democrats running for anything and they i was thinking 
Is that the same thing you were? Yeah, they may have a couple so they still have a couple so weeks to uh, to file, but as of this morning, there are very few, and in fact, in fact, an embarrassingly few number of Democrats that have filed to challenge the Republicans. Well, there's no doubt that the, the Democrats could win all the races. They've got somebody filed in, and still be the tremendously minority party by far. They uh, they wouldn't hardly you couldn't hardly find them in the, in the legislature. They can caucus in a corner. Yeah, I can. I, I realize and I appreciate that, but you cannot win an office if you do not run for an office. And that's, this is the point I'm making, that the uh, the leadership of the Democratic Party keeps saying, well, we're going to have good candidates, but they're not producing. That's the same thing this year, last year, uh, the last several election cycles. Uh, anyway, it's a, a, a tangent. Uh, do you, what I do think you, you can lay part of that. I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah, but no. obviously you can lay part of that to – uh, a fellow who's philosophically, we, we, he and I would never agree. I like him. He's a, he's a nice person to sit around and talk to. Uh, but uh, Pushkin, Delegate Pushkin, the uh, state Republic or Democrat Party chair, I do believe that when you, in the days when you had Belinda Biafor and Larry Puccio, you had active recruiting of candidates. I'm I'm not so sure that Delegate Pushkin knows how to do that. Yeah. Good morning, Ron. This, this is John Gilstrap. Um, we all know that Governor Justice started life as a Democrat and then shifted over to Republican. During his State of the State, he gave away, in theory, about seven hundred million dollars of taxpayers' money, which it kind of does. That do you think show his Democrat? Roots and will that come back as he shifts over to a national election as a Republican for the Senate? Is that going to come back and bite him? Is that ammunition to be used against him? It it, it could be problematic for him at some point. Again, I think that the um, message has to be conveyed, and I'm I know it sounds simple, and it sounds maybe like I'm making a way too simple because every, everybody should know it. But when he comes out to the, to the uh, and I'm not going to try to single anybody out, but when he, when he comes out to the local volunteer fire department, to the local uh, you know, small, small town or less than a thousand people, and they're having a city council meeting and he brings along that half million dollar check, um, there's, uh, there's a tendency that they don't notice I'm sure that it, down deep they know, but they give him credit for getting it for them. He may deserve a little credit, but, you know, there are grants that uh, come through the federal government that he's been out on the road delivering uh, with Baby Dog that, uh, of course, I maybe Baby Dog is the brains of the operation. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't do that to us, Ron. <laughs> uh, but... but um, the, they don't seem the public who attends those kind of meetings and the mayor, you know, the town, small town mayor, the county commissioners seldom ever say anything about, well, gee, I'd like to, you know, I haven't heard the taxpayers thank yet. It's constantly, they want to thank the governor. They want to thank their local legislator. Uh, and, and I don't know that the message ever gets through loud and clear. Um, and I, and I think that you touched as well on the uh, fact that I have many, many, many very knowledgeable legislators who say, I sure am worried the minute that we get a new governor and the federal government money is not rolling in, they may have to create another COVID for the state of West Virginia to stay afloat with the amount of money that they've given to different uh, organizations and that they'll one thing you, you always remember in government, because uh, I've been on both sides of the track, don't give the public anything you don't expect to keep giving them. Now, a few, a few minutes ago, there was sort of a, a, a throwaway line about Alex Mooney being the only person to get you to vote for um, justice. So what's the heartburn with uh, Mr. Mooney? With with uh, Mooney, is that, I, I lost you there. For with Alex Mooney, what where's what is your heartburn with Alex Mooney? He, uh, I, I, the really biggest heartburn with Alex Mooney, having seen it in person, was in that flood of uh, 
what, 2016, was that that mm -hmm. flood on the Elk River, I think? Yes, sir. Um, he, uh, he was the congressman. He uh, had planned, uh, the, the flood was coming, had been predicted. The rivers were rising. They were getting out of their banks. He was due to go on, and it's a little difficult sometimes with Congressman Mooney and his office to find out details of what he's doing, but I did ask two or three times, and it seemed to me that what he was doing was going on a government junket to Egypt, I believe it was, uh, and the day that the water was as high out of its banks as it ever got is when his plane took off from uh, Washington and flew him to wherever that destination was, and he went ahead on a vacation trip, or, or which is what I was calling it, a government junkin. And um, he did finally, when he got back about a week later, uh, come to the scene and hand out some water and some cans of products and that sort of thing. But I just thought, and, and it was a terrible, terrible um, snap to foods, I thought, in the response to people who they, they lost their homes they had no place to stay there was a shopping center at elkview uh which was above charleston north of charleston that the bridge was washed out to people could not get to their medical supplies they couldn't couldn't get groceries and uh as far as congressman mooney shown much concern about that and the second thing it was he never came to I don't. I shouldn't say never. He seldom came to Charleston. Danny Jones, who was mayor, the Republican mayor of uh, Charleston for 20 years, just left office before the current mayor, Amy Goodwin, uh, said on the day that he left office after 20 years that he had never be, met or been introduced to Congressman Mooney, because Congressman Mooney didn't come to Charleston. Ron Gregory, our guest here, political commentator. You have, you have a follow-up to that, uh, John Gilstrap? No, it's just I, I'm a relative newcomer to the state, and I find the very few interactions I've had with Governor Justice, I find him to be a, a fascinating and sort of inspiring is too strong a word, but engaging uh, yeah. fellow. He came out to the air show here in Martinsburg during the summer, and I watched him work that crowd, and there's – the, it the the I love you stuff that we we get from justice. Obviously, there's there's some theater involved with that. But he he impresses me as a guy where that's true. I have no idea if he's a, a good um, a delegator and manager of of the the executive. But I think overall he he princes just mm -hmm. that nice guy, affable. Yes. Ron Gregory, you got a quick, quick uh, question for you. Uh, Riley Moore, of course, is the front runner for the congressional seat that Alex Mooney holds. Uh, however, uh, recently, General Mookie Walker has entered the race as well, and he's a formidable person. Are you familiar with his candidacy at all? Yes. What do you think about this? Is, uh, is there enough uh, weight there behind this name to get some traction against Riley Moore? I don't. I do not believe so. I believe that race is wrapped up. I think Riley Moore. I think it would be very. And and I have very close associates in this game. If we want to call it that. Who think that it? He will make it a con race, close contest. But I don't believe that he will. I think that seat is Riley Moore's with uh, 65 percent of the vote, regardless of who else is running. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, Ron. Uh, why would Mookie Walker, a gentleman that has achieved quite a bit, why would he jump into a race that is probably unwinnable on his part? Unless it's name recognition for something future, I, either, that's about the only explanation that you can come with up with that makes any sense. Now, one of the things that happened uh, often, and, and you, you all have seen it as much as I have, I'm sure, is a candidate who has not been around the block several times politically. Uh, if, if you start down the road or start door to door or you start business to business, at the end of the day, 
uh, once you've talked to 50 business people and 48 of them have told you they're for you and uh, they really don't like Riley Moore, you become convinced you're going to win in a landslide. Uh, now, if that's not part of what's happening to him, I don't know. I I can't, uh, I, you know, for example, uh, President uh, or Senator Manchin uh, running for president has been promised and they sort of promised or shown that they can deliver from some of the national uh, PACs that they would support him for president uh, as a no, no party candidate or, or however he would choose to run. And they've actually had a couple of fundraisers where they've raised three or four million dollars. Uh, if um, I'd have to see something like that if I were a new candidate like uh, the one you, these years that we're talking about. I would have to see some kind of real money raised in addition to the fact that I'm a nice guy and so forth. But I will say again, you know, people like Mr. Haney, too. Uh, <laughs> Jim Justice is your best buddy. Uh, he can talk your talk. He can get get on the level with you. I've never seen anybody more effective at that than uh, Jim Justice, and he's completely different than the, the better ones we've had, which was Arch Moore and, and A. James Manchin were probably the two best at, at making a uh, relationship with the voter. And uh, I, I would say that Jim Justice is just as good as either one of them were. Do you think he is a good and effective, or, and has been a good and effective governor? I think that, again, sort of remains to be seen. I'd like to, I'd like to see two years from now what the state budget looks like and if, if they're calling the state legislature into special sessions to try to figure out how to stop the money hemorrhage. You know, you know we fit Republicans, and I am a Republican, uh, kind of have uh, little doubts about pouring millions and millions of dollars to companies that promise jobs, that promise to do this and that and improve the state, and three years later, they've done nothing. We've, have, we've had a lot of groundbreaking around the state of West Virginia in the past seven years. And if you go back today, that ground is still broke, but there's no business there. Well, it's been the opposite in the eastern panhandle. The, the companies that uh, have promised to come in, and, the, and Bill, you were involved in that as a Berkeley County Commissioner 20 years ago, Commission President. Uh, obviously, we've seen the ground broken and the people hired and making a pretty right. good wage here in the panhandle. Yeah. Go there, ahead, there's plenty that that's not true. There's a, for example, there's a this shell manufacturer, gun manufacturer, that uh, all kind of breaks have been given for to to be in Dale, West Virginia, which is also in Kanawha County, and uh, have yet to to have done anything, and it's been five, six years. Ron, we're about out of time, but shifting very quickly to the legislators uh, this session, uh, do you anticipate any one or two big things coming out of this year's session? No, I think because it's an election year, I think they'll be very, very light on what they do. I think... Uh, if they, uh, of course, you've got people like Senator Tarr, uh, who who would introduce every kind of every piece of legislation he's ever been interested in, <laughs> he'll he'll still do that. But I I think they will be very slow to rock the boat to do anything unusual, uh, and uh, we'll hold off for another year before they do much. Ron, you were no one was safe today, buddy. You were you were going after everybody. <laughs> I thought that uh, I thought that's what your listeners like. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> good stuff. Hey, how do our listeners find your written material, sir? WVStatewide.com, and we do want to mention that um, at 6 p.m. Thursday evening, the we do have a governor's debate that we will be carrying at WVStatewide.com. I understand your station will be carrying WRNR. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the commitments from uh, uh, three of the three of the Republican gubernatorial candidates. We have uh, Chris Miller. We have the, the Attorney General Philip uh, Morsey, and uh, we also have the Secretary of State Mac Warner. Uh, they will be there. More Capito has not committed at this point. 
uh, and uh, that would be the only one of the of the major candidates who is not. I think it'll be an interesting uh, hour or so, and uh, I think uh, the viewers or the listeners will get it. And there can be viewers on our side, and viewers too, I believe. Uh, you know more about that than I do, mm-hmm. but uh, I think uh, it would be an interesting time. I have a few political consultants who say to me it's too early. I've preached for 50-some years of doing political consulting and journalism that it's never too early to start. Uh, they are kind of pushing whether I'm right about that or not, but uh, <laughs> I think it will be a good debate. So Morris is going to participate this time. He did not participate last time. And more capital will and, not, it sounds and, like. And more capital did participate last time, but not this time. So, yeah. Ron, thanks. Right. It, was, it was great to hear from you again, and let's talk again soon. All right. I'll be happy to be back. All right. You brought it today, buddy. You brought it today. Yeah. yeah.